in many ways, it's one of the best things that's happened to Bungie, right? What I really like about this new Bungie relationship with Activision is I never saw it coming. The idea that Bungie would make Halo for a million years was inconceivable. In a lot of ways, we're starting over. I can't wait to see where Bungie is going to take us next. I know it's going to be ambitious. I know it's going to be something exciting. I just want to find out some details on it. Being an underdog and having something to prove and remembering that we're not the top dog anymore is a great thing to happen to us. We're out on our own in the wilderness again, and we have to fight to bring every customer along with us. We've gone from a totally as sure as a thing can get with Halo to tackling a challenge which is even bigger than Halo with no real guarantee of success. There has to be some scared dangling out over the edge of the cliff and hoping that the rope we're weaving is going to hold us. I love being the underdog. It does bring back the early days. We got this great idea and we don't really understand it. It's gonna be fun to figure it out. My senior year of college, I was taking an artificial intelligence class, and Jason was in that class. He had a way cooler computer than I had, which really pissed me off. So, you know, we just got to talking and uh, thought maybe we should try partnering up. It was clear right from the get-go that Alex was the business guy and Jason was the creative guy. Take his ass and take that camera. <laughs> I was working on a game and Alex was trying to start a company. All right, well, here we are in downtown Chicago. This is the classy part of town. The original Bungie office was not here. For that, we gotta go south. We occupied the second floor, so we got broken into a couple times. Several which we... times, yeah. There was that crack house behind the building. I was employee number five. Uh, we were in one room, well, a room and a half. Everybody did everything. And we ended up with pathways. <laughs> pathways in the Darkness was our first successful game that made a profit. Then came Marathon, which was a, a real big hit for us. So, Jason, when are you shipping Marathon? <laughs> Marathon was the first shooter that actually had verticality to it. It had that sci-fi sensibility. I mean, Mac gaming didn't even really exist for me before Marathon. Marathon made me dizzy. I remember being amazed at the sort of the world that Bungie had created. Ah! We were bound by this camaraderie. Do we seem really immature right now? We're actually having some generally good interactions. <laughs> oh, gee. Good Lord. It was our lives, you know, 24-7. It was kind of like being in a band. Soon, you will be food. But the project that we were working on, which was called Myth, I thought was, was really interesting. One of the most significant things that we, that we did with Myth was we developed it for uh, the Mac and the PC at the same time. It's amazing that Bungie was able to sort of nail first-person shooters for the Mac and then move to the other big genre on the PC, which was strategy games, and then nail that with Myth. Myth's the first time that real-time strategy didn't have micromanaging built into it. Sir, we're moving. Myth was a revolution. Hold your fire! It was an RTS that got rid of all the RTS bolt. You use the terrain to your advantage which isn't something that a whole lot of games did at the time. I think Tuncer needs to get the shaft. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't think Bungie was going to last. It didn't seem like they had a real plan for the future. We had the advantage 20 years ago of being really, being really stupid. I mean, being really young, but that young is stupid. <laughs> That's pretty cool to see. In that mindset, like, anything is possible, so you just get started and then you figure out what's hard on the way. This is what I think of the Computer Game Developers Conference. 
<laughs> the first time I met Jason, he said, why are you okay with building environments the way that you're building environments? And I said, well, why would I not be okay? Like, I have some other choice. And he said, yeah, absolutely. That sort of gave me a hint as to, oh, okay, that's kind of what our culture is about. I think it all starts with the idea that we were our own customer and that anybody else who was going to play our games, you know, we were in their shoes. A big moment in Bungie. I think the one that stands out to me more than anything else is, is the Myth 2 installer bug. That installer bug that would, yeah. <laughs> that would remove your computer? <laughs> yeah, if you tried to uninstall the game, it was just a scorched earth policy, like, oh, you don't like Myth? Well, f you. We're taking your machine. There was 500,000 units that were boxed and shrink-wrapped and everything else. Alex decided uh, to do the right thing and recalled all the copies. It was just horrible. They had to reprint all the discs. Everybody was in the office stuffing new CDs into boxes of Myth 2. That cost the company a, a good chunk of money. It was at least a million dollar mistake. A misstep like that is going to put you in some serious jeopardy. It started off with just three of us. We were at that time making what we thought was going to turn out to be a myth-type clone with a sci-fi skin on it. They were doing Blam, which was the code name for this other game that they were working on. We had a, a huge map for a continuous RPG, then before that we like had an RTS. We had no idea what the game was going to be. I had no idea. You know, I was just there to do concepts. It was pretty generic sci-fi. You had your typical military forces, tanks, jeeps, that kind of thing, and uh, some armored guys. We did a lot of thinking about what it meant to be an action game, and could an action game be a real-time strategy game? And the answer was no. We wanted a sci-fi character, a guy in a suit who can go from Earth to space, so we don't have to worry about him changing clothes, and he just needed to look like like a space marine. Oh God, what do we call him? Something like uh, the super soldier. And then, you know, we started to move the camera in closer and closer to the character. What if we put ourselves in this character? What if we became that character? Sorry for the quick thaw, Master Chief. Things are a little hectic right now. Those are the moments where things start to come together. It's Marcus saying like, no, 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 it's, we're going first person because this is more fun. I don't think we would have captured as much of the audience had we stayed in third person. Chief, Cortana says to get to the bridge, double quick. Those are the ideas and the decisions that really change the course of a game and a company. All you greenhorns who wanted to see Covenant up close, this is gonna be your lucky day. Suddenly we had this opportunity to tell a little piece of a story. I remember Joe coming to me and all he said to me was, that's an ancient epic alien. So he just gave me those three words. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just try combining something that does that. Came up with the pounding drums, cellos, monks, alien voice, showed it to the guys on a Monday morning and then they got on a plane to go to New York and show it at Mac World the next day. This is one of the coolest I've ever seen. And we're gonna see, for the first time, Halo. Which really went over big. They were, you know, making games for the Mac, which, you know, was still a pretty small install base at that time. But, you know, Bungie wanted to, I think, do pretty ambitious games. And, you know, to fund the games of that caliber uh, is not easy to do. 
Uh, one day my phone rings telling me that um, Bungie's kind of in financial trouble and that they're um, talking to some people about potentially being acquired. It was going to be really important to Microsoft to have games for the Xbox. That's what was going to make or break it. And so, you know, we called up Ed Freeze and, and said, uh, maybe we should talk. That was a great, great call to get. <laughs> I mean, it was definitely a time when I was open to that kind of a conversation. I had money to spend. I desperately needed content for this new platform that was uh, going to be showing up in uh, less than two years. We knew that there were some financial struggles at that time. There were some strange dudes in black suits walking around the office weeks prior to that. And uh, so we knew something was going on. I'd been there for a couple months, and then I get called into Alex's office, and he's like, so we might be moving to Seattle. And I was like, oh God, I just, you know, <laughs> I just signed a lease. This is a group that where I respected their talent because I had seen their previous games. I mean, I probably would have been interested in them just for the team, but the fact that they had this Halo thing that they were trying to figure out was a plus. Ed came into me one day and said, I want you to go talk to Jason and Alex and, and tell them it's all going to be okay when we buy them. Agreed. Pure and simple, cashed it in, sold our souls, came out here. I mean, if you're gonna sell your soul, Seattle's a pretty nice place to do it. Back in the 90s, Microsoft had an evil empire quality to them, and the idea that they were going to Microsoft was, oh no, they're selling out. That turning point of us going from PC games to console was, I mean, it was gigantic. I think it was a giant gamble. Bungie, I think, presented a good opportunity for them, but it was incredibly risky, too. One of the main pulls for the team to move into Microsoft was to be a part of creating the Xbox and making a game that really used it. Jason said it best, I think. He said that Microsoft is building the biggest cannon in the world and they're pointing it right at Sony and, and we can be the bullet in that cannon and we can make a really big impact on the course of the game industry. All right! Yeah, that's cool. We got very excited about the opportunity to define a platform and to define a franchise that would be important to the platform. Everybody in the office was pissed off because we liked being independent and, you know, kind of the man sort of thing. And then now we go to the console, it's like, hey there, man. <laughs> it's like shaking your hand instead of raising your fist up. It was exciting as well as terrifying. I had this nice spot in this building picked out for them, and I thought they were going to love it, and they hated it. You know, it was typical Microsoft Office, which Microsoft people think are great. Bungie guys looked at me and like, this is awful. This is exactly the opposite of what we want. You know, we want a big open space and just mow down all these walls in this section. People just couldn't fathom being at Microsoft. I remember Ed complaining at one point that even he didn't have a key to get into the Bungie area. The challenge that I think Halo faces is that it was you know, trying to do a first-person shooter on a console platform. One of the biggest challenges was making a shooter that really felt right and worked right on a controller. Yeah, I mean, originally you had to struggle with it really being the first FPS that we were trying to get into on a console. On a controller. With the Duke. It was huge. Coming from PC first-person shooters, it just really felt... Uh, Different, different. The reality of actually shipping on a console, there was a lot of pressure there. And we didn't have anything running on that console at all. When I joined, the AI for Halo was about three source files and a big block comments at the top that were just Jason's log of him frantically trying to get something, anything, up and running. Jamie Griesmer and myself, we just sat down and worked on two signature encounters. One was the beach on silent cartographer, which is the classic kind of wave advancing encounter. And the other was the classic defensive encounter. We really only had one shot at it because we weren't gonna have time to go back and scrap the AI system. So we just knew we had to get it right. We had a lot of content to build, gameplay experiences to create. So all these grand ideas we had of this huge open world experience quickly dissipated. Bungie has always had a way of finding out what's important in a particular game style and throwing away the extraneous stuff. I'm going to see if we can save some soldiers. Roger, Cortana. I think there were a very small group of people who felt like Halo would be the defining 
game of the Xbox. There were a lot of other games that were getting a lot more attention really than Halo. Malice, uh, Munch's Odyssey, uh, racing game. I think they put a lot of their bets on this game called Azurek. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Master Chief was certainly a part of it, but he wasn't the guy. It wasn't preordained that it was going to be Halo. Halo earned that right, you know, by being one of the best titles in development at the time. Good luck, Master Chief. On Halo, one of the moments that always sticks out in my mind was once we actually got V30 up and running and you could play it. Just something as simple as driving the Warthog on V30, which was fun. That was a defining game experience. They brought me in, here's a prototype Xbox, here's a prototype controller, and here's this game called Halo. And he said, you know, Bungie. I'm like, who? <laughs> Mac game? Are you joking? He gives it to me, and I'm, and I'm sort of staring around, I'm like, oh wow, this is Amazing. Like, I just, and, and all it was was the B30 running around on the beach and just shooting stuff. I was like, this is fantastic. There was such an energizing moment. I said, oh, you know, this is what we're actually making. All of a sudden, the team just kind of got traction and kicked in and started going at, at high gear. At that time, there were three teams. There was the Halo team, there was still the, the Phoenix team, and then there was the Oni team. They owe it all to the Oni team because before we came up from San Jose, they had no multiplayer, so the multiplayer designer and the multiplayer programmer came from the Oni team. Getting closer and closer to the deadline for Halo, each one of those teams ended up getting absorbed into the Halo team because there was just no way we were going to make it. We almost cut multiplayer out of it a few days before we had to ship the build because it wasn't really working that well. You know, we were having arguments about how many people can actually connect a box together. We we're like, yeah, maybe in college dorms people will do it, but who's going to carry a TV to their friend's house? Everybody was pushing to keep multiplayer in, but none of us knew just what it would mean. That was the first time I had felt like I was part of a, a team that was moving inexorably towards something. The awesome thing was watching the game being built. I probably wouldn't have made the Covenant guys so colorful, but that was a request from Jason. Shinier, brighter, more color. I'm like, dude, you're nuts, man. This thing's like rainbow, it's horrible. Obviously it worked. I mean, he, he knows it from a gameplay perspective. Like, this is what makes games tick. Sleep well? No thanks to your driving, yes. So you did miss me. I think I auditioned with a British dialect, and then I auditioned with just a vaguely Spanishy, Frenchy, German sound. <laughs> and I don't know if it was Marty or who said, just, just do your own voice, get in your lower register, and give that to us. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started. Halo was incredibly unique, because it, you know, there wasn't anything like it this sort of perfect storm of music and art and universe design. You could see that someone had really thought through a world. And the greatest stories, in, especially in the sci-fi realm, are coherent visions. The continuity comes from an underlying vision that shines through. Halo was an action game. It put you in this world where you could be the most powerful actor in this rich physical simulation. It gave you this ability to become competent and then show your competence to your friends competitively or to your friends cooperatively. I'll never forget this. I get like a headshot on Zach and I'm like, sit the f down. And there's like applause. And I turn around and there's a group of people who are watching. And before I know it, like we have this f***ing line. And people were like coming in, playing their 10 minutes of Slayer, just getting right back in line. Multiplayer and Halo just go hand in hand. Now they get it. The multiplayer was the, the thing. Oh, yeah!
story of Halo 2 is kind of like a three-act tragedy. In Halo 2, they really wanted to take even another step up in terms of uh, the depth of the story in the universe. I mean, Joe and, and Jason and stuff have created this really rich universe, richer than you could get across purely in even the tools that they had at their disposal. The first act where we were all optimistic and naive and we're all sitting down and saying this game is going to be 72 times more fun than Halo 1 because we've got all these great weapons and vehicles and environments and we're just going to jam as much stuff as we can in. There was a lot of new technology that was being, um, you know, researched. And we had to throw out a lot of stuff that we had wanted to do. We wrote this graphics engine that was totally unsuited to the Xbox. We had these ideas for levels that just really didn't make sense with the Halo engine or for any kind of shooter engine. We really wanted to do a game where we felt every mission, every environment is going to feel totally unique. We let our ambition lead us into some very, very scary places. Multiplayer for Halo 2 was really a, a gigantic thrust for, for what, what we wanted to give Halo that we couldn't in Halo 1. Our goal was absolutely to create the virtual couch. Halo 1's multiplayer was done by, you know, three or four people tops in six months. Halo 2's multiplayer was a massive investment. That kind of resource crunch really caused a lot of tensions on the single player side of things because now all of a sudden we're trying to build multiplayer environments that have to look as good as the single player part of the game. We get to that first time when we get 16 boxes all working together and, and Understand that it wasn't like there was a bu bunch of maps to go play now. It was just we got 16 boxes and we were able to kind of run around and it didn't crash. We absolutely love playing multiplayer. I mean, everybody in the studio is playtesting these maps every day. Sniper, sniper! Oh, oh, yeah. Holy like I'm talking to you and I'm totally shooting you in the head right now and that's amazing. In many ways, Halo 2 was the title that was the breakout title for Xbox Live. The Xbox team, we co-developed with them or helped them design and develop what they called the Tsunami feature set, which was a lot of the new live matchmaking multiplayer features. We built our own friends list, which you can now do friends and friends parties in the Xbox Live Dash, but we built it in Halo 2 first. The console world kind of pushed back and said, those aren't console-y things to do. You guys don't get it but we really did get it because we had already seen it be successful on the PC. You know, we had, we had seen that multiplayer play is the future. And the first time he jumps on, the crowd just, you know, goes to this really loud cheer. And I mean, it was just, wow, it would give you chills sitting there. It's something that you don't really see very often at E3 in the middle of a demo where people just like, yeah, that's awesome. No, you know, we can't wait another year. You know, <laughs> no. I'm sorry. We can't wait. This game has to come out now. Yeah. I don't say the word awesome. Usually dude doesn't come out of my mouth. But the truth is, the game is awesome, dude. How the this hell game. are you going to beat this game? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it up. Let's get it out of here. Yeah. Yeah. But then, on Halo 2, Alex had left the company to go back to Chicago, and Jason had left the project to go and work on Phoenix. So without Alex and Jason, the Halo 2 team was led by a committee. And we kind of went through the, the second act, where we were really trying to deliver something that was just impossible. We kind of found ourselves standing there after E3 2003, and we are kind of looking around and saying, okay, well, 
We can't possibly build this game. We were going to show something at E3 that was actually going to be in the game. It's not in the game. It was very clear at the time that the future of the studio was in Halo 2, and if Halo 2 failed, that, that, that the studio was going to be a very different and less fun place to be in. They were going to go back and rework things, and Jason was going to get more involved. And uh, then they came back and told me it was going to basically be a year slip. The f devil himself stood up and told us we were never going to ship it, and f you, and rammed his pitchfork up our asses. Halo 2 is you know, not where we want it to be right now. How do we top what we did before? And even if we would say, while wow, we're too tired to top what we did before. The pressure is there, and I think we put it on each other. A disastrous flaming turd of failure would be uh, probably the right way to say it. We have the whole climax of the game planned out on Earth, and we're not doing it, and that, and that sucks. Before Halo 2, we could fail in silence and in misery, but no one really knew when we were failing. And then something like Halo 2, where Everybody knew that we cut missions at the end, that we lopped off our third act. We failed spectacularly in public as far as the story was concerned. Yeah, they literally did have to cut off sort of the end of the game. There's the big knife, and we just chop it sometimes. And, you know, it must have been heartbreaking, I'm sure, to the guys at Bungie. It's a trade-off we've got to make. We can't develop forever, otherwise there'd never be a game. Our nuts like fell in the fire and like they really weren't totally burned when we picked them up. Like we kind of made it at the end, you know? I, they still worked. As much of a death march as Halo 2 was, we got to the end of it and there's a bunch of seeds there that are exciting and, and really fed the rest of the trilogy. This is Spartan 117. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. The difference between entertainment that's successful and entertainment that's forgotten is only how people react to it. So no matter how successful we were on Halo 2, it doesn't matter how hard you worked, and they don't give a if it took you two seconds or six years and 20 gallons of blood. I looked at our bug count and we were in triage and I realized we were going to make it, like we were actually going to ship this game, and uh, I think that was the... Uh, Probably, the, probably one of the proudest moments for me, just because it had been so hard. The biggest legacy that, that Bungie has had is, is in the community. I got him out, I got him out, I got him out. <laughs> All of us were caught by surprise to just to see the how it became a cultural phenomenon in its own way with people gathering in, in basements and having land games. Don't jump. We have competitive people, we have people who like to play for fun, we have campaign people, multiplayer people, firefight people. Doesn't matter how far or how hard it is to get here, we do it because we love it. We've got people that flew here from Sweden, we've got people from every corner of the country. And that's not a hardship, that's hard enough. <laughs> I pick people up that I have never met before, and I drive them here from the airport, and it's crazy. I mean, I've never met them, but somehow we share this bond. Somehow we've been friends, even though they've only existed as characters on a chat room screen. You have people here that didn't even start with Halo. They started with Myth or Marathon, and you know they've carried through this whole time, and it's incredible. Bungie's always showed a, a love for its community. Uh, they're here right now. They're not just a gaming company. There's an, an interpersonal relationship between the millions of fans that Bungie has and the employees. Anytime we get together and have a LAN party like this, you see that interaction. You see people joking around together and having fun. It's fantastic. To me, it's become more about the community than the games. A huge chunk of my life has been this game and this company and, and the fans of this game. 20 years from now when I'm not playing games at all anymore, maybe. This is the stuff I'll remember. We were kind of in on 
the ground floor, seeing how this group of guys in Chicago, uh, seeing them slowly work their way up and not forget us. When you're spending that much time invested in a game, it is nice to know that people are listening to your responses to it. I remember hearing feedback from people when I started working at, on, at Bungie, and I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you guys actually listen to your community? And we're like, that's how we've always kind of done things. I went to E3 and signed autographs, and that blew my mind that there were so many people in line to and excited about this game. Bungie's done an amazing job, I think, you know, speaking to its community on an ongoing basis. Bungie! Had me at Halo. <laughs> How is our expression? I think that because they were obsessive in what is this world, who are these people, that you could get a community forming that would do derivative fan-based work. And my favorites of this are the, um, uh, the Red vs. Blue series. How ironic. No, that's not ironic. Ironic would be if we had to work together to hurt each other. No, ironic would be instead of that guy kidnapping Lopez, Lopez kidnapped him. I think it would be ironic if our guns didn't shoot bullets, but instead squirted a healing salve that cured all wounds. I think it would be ironic if everyone was made of iron. The fact that Red vs. Blue even exists is a testament to what Bungie does for their community. Absolutely. Because anyone else would have just been, you know, bam, cease and desist. Hey Jeff, look what I got in the mail. So. <laughs> let's, let's move to Mexico. <laughs> Where we are today with the community, you can capture it all and bundle it up and say, this is what we're all experiencing together, developers and players. They do things with Halo that we never expected. There were all kinds of people, you know, having contests about how high you could blow the Warthog up if you got enough plasma grenades. Randall Glass's Warthog jump video really resonated with the community because he was doing something really cool inside of the game with the physics engine and the Warthog, uh, and, and people were inspired by that. Getting to places on the maps that we had never seen before, creating art in the forge, and when you realize the impact the work that you're doing has on people and such a broad group of people, it's really surprising. Because of the community nature of the storytelling, right? They, they find the pieces and tell it to each other. And so they're the storytellers rather than just consuming a story. People live it and breathe it. And that breeds real communities, not just inside of the game, but people that create lifelong friendships. People get married in Bungie games. And I think that's, that's pretty incredible. Halo 3 right now? That's all. We wanted to create something that stood out from the crowd a little bit. It was really important to us to end on a high note with Halo 3. Send me out. Halo 3 was going to be the end of the trilogy. We knew that we had to do it better than we did Halo 2. So it was going to be a focused, concerted effort throughout to make sure that Halo 3 was the jewel on the crown. I still remember the first Halo 3 reveal trailer, Master Chief kind of walking through that smoke. I think what really dazzled people about that trailer was that it was in engine. A really powerful moment, I think, to realize that uh, this world of Halo was going to be taken to the next level. We're shipping on a new box. We've got all this new tech. We're kind of rewriting the engine. We've got higher def. You know, everybody was fighting over, over all these, all the new memory, all the new processing power. You know, where was it gonna go? Was it gonna go to graphics? Was it gonna go to AI? I remember that as being like one of my most nervous like 
are we gonna be able to do it? Like, are we actually gonna finish it? It's one of the top risks on Halo 3 is we're gonna have to cut co-op again because we can't get it to, to work. Nothing got done today. What? We had a crash. You had a lot of influx of new people. Uh, closing on bug number 25,000. They were super excited to work on a Halo game. So that actually carries you. I think it's cool. You think it's cool? Yeah. <laughs> If you do something cool, then the artists will go out of their way to try to use it. Seeing all this water all just popping up and down, you know, like in every level, that really makes me uh, very happy. And so that's got to be one of my favorite moments. The way that the, the lighting came together, seeing the skies on the 360 for the first time, sketching out those ideas and watching it step by step come to fruition, and then finally seeing it on TV for the first time, I was just going through that process, was amazing. We went through a full year of pre-production on this project. And so when we moved to Halo 3, when we moved to the new Xbox, we could do close-ups, we could do solid facial animation. Where is she, Chief? Where's Cortana? What's gonna happen to the Chief? What's gonna happen to Cortana? Chief. Cortana? High Charity, the Prophet's holy city is on... Cortana. Cortana plays a huge role in the fiction of this game, and we didn't want people to forget about her. We actually see her fighting for her existence. Oh! <laughs> It was just a really powerful idea for us. You know me when I make a promise. You keep it. I do know how to pick them. Lucky me. If it was just a straight, now go find her, here's a map, people wouldn't care. I will have my revenge on a prophet, on a plague. My feet tread the path. I shall become a god. You will be fooled. Nothing more. No! From characters to environments, their story at every level. People really do believe we're a community of storytellers. That's extremely exciting that we've made that evolution. Truth and the Covenant, the Flood, it's finished. It's finished. I miss you. Wake me when you need me. Halo 3 to me seemed to be like the the next step after Halo 2 from the point of view that's when we added Forge, File Share, Safe Films, and Co-op. We added save films in, in Halo 3, and the gamers out there could, could pause and stop and really study the explosions and rotate the camera around there and, and really look at the work. That was a real-time direct connection to our community. It was probably the moment at, at Halo 3 launch where I realized, wow, this, this is as big as anything can get. I remember being in Manhattan where the big launch was occurring, and it was absolute pandemonium. Bungie turned it into this seminal, worldwide cultural event. You might not see people playing games because it's practiced in their own home, but everybody is doing it. Less than 50 seconds until you guys get your hands on Halo 3. You pumped? So excited right now. Back when Bungie was founded, you know, Jason and Alex and their friends, the culture of Bungie was pretty simple. There's a bunch of college kids who wanted to drink beer and eat pizza and like do amazing cool stuff in their basements. It's such an important cultural ideal here that this studio owns what it creates. Independence was going to be the only thing that was going to be able to allow us to do what we wanted to do. In the end, I think the transition was good for Bungie, the journey through Microsoft, the being able to integrate on the Xbox. 
we're at a different studio and a more potent studio. We're gonna do things that we never could have done. The deal was essentially, we make a couple more Halo games, we leave Halo with Microsoft, and we can split amicably. So, I mean, ultimately the price of our freedom was to, to leave our baby behind, to move from being Halo developers to Halo fans. Having to leave Halo behind because we left Microsoft, it's kind of a high price, but that's the price of the next thing that you're gonna give birth to. That's going to be a seminal moment for the studio. Harold had promised Microsoft we had two more Halo games, and Reach was only one of them. What can we do in one year with the engine we've already built, not a whole lot of engineers, just a handful of artists? What can we do in a year to get a game out the door? Harold looked at us and said, make it happen. ODST was a lot of fun because it was a smaller team. It got back to, you know, feeling a little bit like what that Halo 1 experience was. We wanted to try something that we'd never done before and breaking the mold of what people expect from Halo. Even faced with making a game in a year, we, we couldn't just kick something out. We, we wanted to make it different. We wanted to tell an interesting story in a new way. Pretty early on, film noir was mentioned, detective story was mentioned. Putting that twist on telling a small story inside the universe just coalesced super quick. Very early on, we latched on to the concept of uh, the nighttime city. It was always more about the silence and the mood and the ambience. I did brand new music for ODST because it was such a different mood. It was not at all the big space opera. It was the one day, one night story, film noir, rainy, wet, wonderful atmosphere. For me, it meant this should all be new music. I was kind of hoping that it wouldn't be six hours of new music, but it ended up being about six hours of new composed music. You know the music, time to dance. ODST, ODST is the best single ODST player. ODST is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the best Halo campaign in existence. It, it's the only one I have told Joe worth Statton playing. this. I have taken Joe Statton by the shoulders and shaken him in this fashion. It was the best one Bungie has kicked out, in my opinion, in terms of single player campaign. Everyone will agree, not only should games have stories, have great stories, but that we're all in charge of telling it. The FNG, a rookie, not exactly green. No ODST is. If I didn't think he could do the job, I wouldn't have him on my six. He doesn't say much, but I don't care. I just need him to listen. With Firefight, we knew we could take these intense experiences and kind of uh, expand them out into a co-op flavored uh, game type. Firefight really came from the idea of the gravity room in Halo 1. It's where you go up in Truth and Reconciliation into the ship. That room has multiple entrances in, and these elites start coming to attack you, and they come out of different doors. What's it like to, to be trapped in a place and have to defend it from never-ending enemies that continually get harder? We knew it was going to be big, but we didn't know like that fans would react to it the way they did. But it was. Those were, those were definitely good times. ODST was the beginning. It was the first one that we did that was not as Microsoft employees. We were Bungie employees at that moment, and that was really exciting. The Covenant have found Earth. They own New Mombasa. Anyone that could have driven them off is dead or gone. I'd say that makes for desperate times. Me and my team? Guess we're the desperate measures.
It's the winter contingency. He can't help us all. Reach was just perfect. It was the perfect fit for all of the ideas that we were talking about in the early days. Doing something with a little bit of a harder edge than Halo 3. You know, bringing back the scariness and the alienness of the Covenant. All of those sort of dovetailed perfectly with Reach. I think Halo Reach was the game we were trying to make from the beginning. Reach is it, having so much to it. The campaign and the co-op and the DLC and the firefight. I mean, there's just so many elements to these games now. We have this opportunity to look at the entire franchise and we were like, okay, it's now our time to close out Bungie's contribution to the Halo universe. How are we gonna do that in a way that, that does justice to this big thing that we created? We're able to pick up the notepad and say, oh man, look at these 15 things that we crossed out we just couldn't do. And let's, let's start there and then let's see what else we can do as well on top of that. Having a rich online experience, a rich set of services that we'd written ourselves, bring deeper immersion into our campaign and our cinematics. MoCap became integral into all of our gameplay animation systems. If you look back on the whole series, our animation system actually had pretty much been the same. We hit this point where we just said to ourselves, I think it's time now to take animation into that next generational leap. We had to figure out how to create high-res models, approaching the art from a whole different point of view. Like with Reach, it was, let's make it much grungier and dirtier, like these guys have been in the shit. We wanted to pull the helmets off all the Spartans, and we wanted to get to know each one of those Spartans up close and personal. They needed to be human. Reach has been good to me. Time has come to return the favor. Don't deny me this. Really make sure they conveyed that emotion. You see that literally on their faces. You want to know if we're losing? I know we're losing. I want to know if we've lost. Reach was the ultimate Halo game. The biggest Halo game we had ever made, the most exciting Halo game we had ever made. It was absolutely liberating to no longer be tied to the storylines from Halo 1, 2, and 3 to sort of know that we were making a standalone. I don't think you can make a good game these days without taking into account all elements of it. What else can we do with Halo that we haven't done yet? Well done, Noble Six. Uppercut initiated. Firefight, invasion, armor abilities, um, even the ability to sprint in a map started changing really fundamentally how the game played. And then with firefight and invasion, really seeing like what could we do with this game that we love so much, like what direction could we push it in where we were excited to play it. God bless Steve Cotton for Forge World. He's like given the task, hey, let's build the ultimate Forge experience, which at that time was much smaller. Before you knew it, we had this incredible space. And Steve was like, he believed in it, and he was so excited about it, and he couldn't help but to like look at it and go, God, I believe in that too. I think anyone that played Reach and was a fan of Halo, I think, felt a, a sense of completion. I look at that final sequence with, you know, the helmet sitting there shattered and, you know, the, the world around. I mean, it actually, you know, it reminded me of that first moment when I saw Halo at E3. I was more proud of Reach than I was of, like, any game I've ever worked on. With ODST, with, with Reach, in ways that we haven't revealed yet, we absolutely learned important things from all, all of those games. How does it feel to finally be launching this game? It feels better than we ever thought it was going to be. I mean, we're super excited to have this game finally, finally get out there in the hands of our fans. And the reviews are out online. People are loving this game. They're saying it's the best Halo game you guys have ever created. The last 10 years have been a whirlwind of creative construction of an amazing universe building huge teams, nearly burning out a couple times, and ultimately leading to something like Halo Reach that 
to me was all of the right things put together. Like that was a great way to end the Halo series. That was the perfect way to do it. There was always a culture of, of reflection and of not being satisfied with something just being okay, with really feeling like it, it has to be great. At the end of every production, they draw on a whiteboard a plane that's on fire, and then the analogy is you've, you've got to land, right? Like, this sucker's got to land sooner or later, but you've, you've also got to think about what's most vital to the experience. If you hold on to everything in the back of the plane, all your dreams, all your hopes, all your aspirations, you're going to blow up. So you've got to eventually get light and land that sucker. There's a lot of great stuff that was almost cut. The shotgun was almost cut. But, you know, good is never good enough for Bungie. Everybody cares. Everybody sits in the same big pit, and we're all in it together, and it's a good feeling. The people here are really critical. It's really hard to impress them. Yet, the best part is how much fun it is to work with them. We've joked about it as a three-ring circus. Sometimes the spotlight shifts around. Everything is really active at all times. As we get better at doing things, we also keep biting off more and more and more, meaning that we're always on the verge of tackling something too big and falling on our faces. There's always this moment where everything just comes together, it all coalesces, and the effects guy goes like, here's what I've been working on for 18 months, bam! And it just all self-assembles, almost as if it's a sentient being. There's a reason I'm loyal. I didn't know I was a first-person shooter until I played Halo. I put my faith in Bungie. No matter what, that's who Bungie is. We're always gonna make what we wanna make, and we're gonna make it a game that we wanna play. I've been there, I've seen the noses to the grindstones. I know what's going on. I know that they're working hard. I know that they're passionate. I wanted to make sure that the fans know that we did Halo because we wanted to do Halo, and we did the ODST because we wanted to do ODST, and we did Reach because we wanted to do Reach. But now we want to do something brand new, and now we want to do something different. I can't wait to share with the fans what we're working on. We are moving on. We're building something new, something totally different. Looking forward, everything needs to be invented. Everything has to be created from scratch. There, there are no characters that are returning because all the characters are new. It's really exciting to be part of such a big team working on something brand new. Bungie's next project is, is obviously incredibly ambitious and incredibly exciting. You know, a new world, a new universe. There's a scale to what Bungie wants to do, which people have not seen before. We feel responsible for not just telling an isolated story, but for building a universe that at some point is going to become more the fans than ours. It's going to take a life of its own. We don't know what the future holds. We have to push past that self-doubt and that fear. If it's not scary, then it's not going to be good. We have other ideas. We have other you know, worlds that we want to create. We want to build a universe where any crazy shit can happen. We've got all that experience making really big games, so we know that what we're aiming for is going to be just that much bigger. One reason that Tiger is so intriguing to so many people in the studio is that it's reaching players in ways that we haven't before. That's it. That's going to be fun. Clear the f***ing table. I believe that it absolutely will be a game changer in the way that, that Halo was a game changer. We didn't even know how big Halo was going to get. How, how can anything be bigger than Halo? We'll find out.